Welcome, everybody. So in this talk, uh, we wanted to give you a brief update of, of, of how the OSIS deployment is, is going at CERN and uh, all the lessons we learned along the way since we started adopting it uh, last year, early, early last year. And, uh, and yes, uh, let's, let's pop, uh, pop up the hood and see what's, what's going on inside. So a little bit about me. Um, I work as a, as a DevOps at the IT Storage Group. I'm a bit of an automation and, and CI uh, nerd in here. And I'm always uh, following the, the latest uh, cloud native trends and, and buzzwords out there. I've been a non-cloud contributor since uh, 2016, and I'm a little bit more personal about me. I'm a huge board games and gastro nerd. Uh, in case you need anything after my talk, uh, you can contact me uh, with, with my socials there. So it's not my first time on the on the OnCloud conference. Uh, my last time was actually on, on 2017, so it feels great to be to be back and and to say hi to all of you. And uh, let's let's try to explore uh, what uh, journey we had uh, with our OSIS migration and which which point we are in. So uh, a bit of a, an overview of uh, what will be explored over the talk. Uh, so which objectives and challenges we, we want to accomplish by migrating to OSIS, what, what moved us to, to, to do this big, uh, this big move, um, how we explore the cloud native architectures and how can they, uh, how, how can they be used uh, to, uh, to suit our purpose, um, how does our production ready deployment looks like, uh, which is about to be rolled out, and some conclusions and next steps from, from all this, uh, from all the journey. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the uh, sand because I think my, my colleagues already did a really good job uh, uh, doing it. Uh, but what I'm uh, going to give you is a bit of context of uh, Sandbox. So uh, Sandbox is, is a service that it has been running at Sand, serving uh, all of our uh, user community for more than six years, it, almost seven. I, if I recall correctly, it will be seven uh, before uh, the end of October. Uh, it has more than uh, 3, 000, uh, uh, 33,000 active users, sorry, and more than 22 petabytes of uh, storage uh, available capacity. So with all these figures in mind, we faced uh, quite a few issues, uh, namely scalability and manageability, especially due to the fact that we were uh, integrating with, with EOS, which was not uh, originally what was conceived, uh, what OnCloud was conceived to, to be running on top of. Um, but also, um, there was a, a few problems uh, for us uh, running into uh, merge uh, hell with our forks and so on. Uh, so I, I leave you, I leave you here a link to a presentation I gave on the CS3 conference this year. If you're interested on the scale uh, we are running and some of the figures that we handle every day. But let's let's take a trip down to memory lane and uh, let's uh, go back to 2018 uh, where it all started. So uh, with all these issues in in uh, in hand uh, and uh, facing all these all these problems uh, on a, on a daily basis, uh, Sand was uh, already running uh, a fork of phone cloud connected to this, uh, this uh, project that, that was getting born by that time, which was called uh, Riva. So at that point, uh, we, we managed to make a, a, a DevOps hackathon at, here at Sand, which I was uh, very happy to, to, to be invited to, and uh, to discover all the limitations and all the problems that uh, Sen was facing uh, due to, to his scale. Uh, so enough with the uh, with the uh, memories. Uh, let's let's try to see what was the objectives of our of of, of our move. So there was a few uh, user requests that were coming uh, very often to us, uh, like a new uh, UI, uh, better improvements in terms of how files were shared, uh, how the ACLs worked, and uh, which applications could integrate with OnCloud. Uh, so we really needed a way to be flexible and to uh, be able to extend OnCloud in a way that suits us better. 
uh, all of these, well, of course, we guarantee a smooth migration for all our users. And uh, as I said, uh, redu uh, re reducing the friction with the upstream projects, because we really don't want to keep maintaining a lot of uh, forks that are uh, really uh, an issue for us. We want to be consumers of, of software, not, uh, not to be uh, actively maintaining these forks. So there were a few challenges uh, due to this uh, incredible size of, of, of uh, change. Uh, like uh, John was mentioning on his uh, previous talk, uh, it is a complete rewrite of the on-cloud code base. So this, this poses a, a lot of challenges itself, but it also, it's a new distributed microservice architecture. So we need uh, a new way of deploying things. Uh, we need a new way of handling uh, how how the different things behave and where the different things are located. And of course, uh, we really need uh, to maintain feature parity with OnCloudX for our uh, minimum viable product. So we don't take uh, features away from our users. So for this, uh, one of the first things that we implemented when we started like adopting OSIS was our, uh, our, our canary switcher. So all of our users that will be invited to the um, to the OSIS uh, beta. It will they will be able to switch back and forth from the from their uh, version. So, um, what was the role of uh, cloud native architectures in our uh, in our project? Uh, so, uh, at the beginning, we we thought in in uh, using Kubernetes uh, for deploying OSIS in production, but then uh, this idea was replaced by um, by keeping things as minimal as possible, but we still did uh, develop a, a good amount of expertise on, on, Kuben on running OSIS on top of Kubernetes. And this is because it brings us a lot of benefits in terms of how can we uh, take advantage of the environments uh, Kubernetes provides us. So we can set up uh, an entire uh, ecosystem of microservices and dependencies on Kubernetes in a really easy way. And uh, it allows us to actually test and put the, the system, the entire system end to end uh, to test for it. Um, at the same time, we also had the, a bit of an expertise already on, on ScienceBox, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, a, a packaged uh, a stack of all the software that we run at SAN, including EOS and things like uh, the Swan uh, data analytics platform. And uh, in this way, we also anticipate a future where, where services will probably run on Kubernetes when we achieve more expertise on, uh, on, on this uh, new technology. So on, QT, on, on Q2 of 2020, uh, we started testing uh, on Cloud Infinite Scale as a replacement for a fork uh, with a set of Helm charts that we developed here at SAM. And uh, as I said, it, it served very well as a sandbox uh, for development, testing, and many other environments. Uh, we took as reference the uh, all-in-one binary to basically split in functional domains the different components of OnCloud. So uh, we still wanted to use uh, the OSIS binary, but uh, in, in different microservices distributed and uh, deployed uh, as individual uh, Kubernetes entities. And uh, uh, the way we uh, the way we managed to to uh, to connect uh, to different uh, SAN services was really helpful for us to troubleshoot and to essentially anticipate what what was coming for us uh, when we move to when we will move to production. So, for instance, we uh, managed to connect uh, this deployment to EOS to our identity provide uh, provider services uh, to our group management services uh, and also uh, things like. Uh, uh, our databases and uh, our monitoring and logging systems. So here you have a few of uh, all the screenshots uh, of, of such uh, services connected to our uh, ephemeral OSIS deployments. Um, aside from that, uh, the Kubernetes deployment also served as well to um, provision uh, additional dependencies in an easy way, because we usually did that uh, via Puppet and uh, playing around with operators gave, gave us a lot of flexibility and a lot of also 
expertise in terms of uh, the configuration we could apply to to these uh, to these dependencies and also uh, it helped us enorm enormously to 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 test the access with the scene client and uh, as well as the smashbox test suite that uh, revealed a few problems already in an early stages of, of adopting it I, I just wrote here a couple of examples so for instance uh, one last uh, remark of, of what we tested with uh, with uh, our kubernetes deployment was uh, the sharding scenario so one thing that will be mentioned uh, also on, on Ishank's uh, presentation uh, which which comes after mine is that uh, we at SAN, uh, to run at this scale, we need, uh, of course, uh, to distribute the storage among different instances. And uh, for this, uh, the, the, the rule of thumb we apply is, is to maintain uh, separate connections to separate EOS uh, storage backend instances. Uh, in this way, uh, three different uses that are uh, named Alice, Bob, and Carol will end up in different EOS, um, EOS instances depending on their initial. So this was also a learning exercise that we did to validate and also to extend the Riva uh, to our needs, because this wasn't foreseen uh, while, we while we designed the, the, the application. So with all this in mind, uh, let's try to pop up the head the the hood of our deployment and tell you all the secrets about it so our production ready deployment to the date is based on uh, physical servers uh, running centos 7. all of our uh, runtimes so the osis uh, the osis uh, daemon server and the riva runtimes that i will explain to you why why we need the riva as well as osis running on the background uh, are uh, wrapped by uh, systemctl templates, essentially to simplify uh, their deployment and ensure up time. Uh, we got this benefit from from the scheduler on on the Kubernetes deployment, but in this in this sense, uh, we we need a, a way to uh, maintain all the all the microservices running even if they crash, because uh, it will happen uh, on on the development stage we are currently. Uh, but there is also a few reasons that uh, remain that uh, still uh, forced us to maintain a few forks of 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 the of the of the OSIS code base as well as the UI, and these are uh, the developer velocity. So we might need the, to implement things uh, and test them. So the easiest way to do it is is using forks, but also uh, we need the, to compile an entire code base that is based on mono repo plus microservices scenarios that might not be trivial to, to deploy. Um, so as I said, uh, we, we run the, the daemons as system CTL units, even for the dependencies. So for instance, we use uh, Redis to keep a cache of all our uh, group objects and things like uh, our users and so on. Um, for OSIS, uh, we run the OSIS server stack as well as the um, extensions uh, that we need for our uh, our deployment that I will also explain in a bit. And uh, uh, a few uh, Riva daemons uh, for different uh, for di for different uh, uses. So this uh, we will also see in a minute. Um, apart from that, uh, we also we also developed uh, a few operational scripts. As I said, uh, this in the Kubernetes scenario, uh, was all handled through the through the kubectl CLI, uh, but uh, in in this uh, sense uh, we needed a way to orchestrate the uh, the way these uh, these units are run. So we developed as well a uh, few scripts to essentially reboot, uh, recompile, and maintain the the OSIS and Riva daemons running. So. Um, for a detail on, on our architecture, uh, as I said, uh, we uh, we run the OSIS server uh, stack uh, plus uh, extensive configuration, uh, which is uh, nowadays uh, really easy to set up and to um, to 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 understand uh, what every parameter is doing. But we also run a few OSIS extensions. So, uh, for instance, uh, we have a an EOS project uh, extension that handles 
essentially all things related to uh, project spaces uh, here at SAM. The way we collaborate is through project spaces. The Canary switcher that I already mentioned uh, uh, allows the users to switch back and forth uh, from, from uh, on Cloud 10 deployment and OSIS. Uh, Root.js, which was already presented by Gian Maria yesterday on, on the workshop one. And uh, uh, Swan, which is essentially uh, um, a way to access uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, through the sandbox interface and to preview them uh, on the same interface. Um, also, these uh, additional Riva demos that I mentioned before are needed to essentially connect to these uh, many EOS instances that we run and, and need and to maintain a set of registry rules uh, that will essentially be used to connect users to uh, each particular uh, service, server. Um, as well as Riva daemons acting as application providers. Uh, this we will see in a minute as well. So a bit of our configuration. Um, so the, 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 the couple of things that I want to highlight here is that we use our own uh, account backend. So we disabled the, the, the OSIS uh, account uh, backend uh, to replace it and to plug into our own. Uh, these also have uh, a lot of implications in terms of uh, performance caching and so on. Um, uh, as for the storage, uh, we really need to configure uh, EOS uh, to a really good level of detail and uh, especially the registry rules that are uh, this uh, used to map every user to, to, the, to the right uh, instance. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, for the web UI config, uh, we specify things like uh, the OpenID Connect parameters, uh, the applications we are running, the OSIS extensions we are running, plus the branding, uh, all the branding for our uh, deployment in this uh, JSON file. So um, on a high level detail, uh, this could be considered our reference architecture. So as, as I mentioned, we have uh, four kinds of storage uh, providers connected to different things that take uh, different responsibilities and that provide different mount paths. So as the simplest way, imagine if we only had a couple of instances of EOS, one for our user homes and one for our projects, um, this would be uh, connected via uh, this uh, kind of rules. But when we want to move to the sharding scenario, we need to move, mul multiply uh, these many demons for all the EOS instances that we're running times three as the number of storage providers that are connecting users to their shares and their homes. And uh, the, uh, the same, uh, so three, three uh, EOS providers per instance as well, uh, connecting to the different EOS project instances. Uh, this also includes uh, bundling the, the EOS or XRDCP client in, in every unit. So the, the, the different daemons can speak with, directly with EOS and Nginx as a reverse proxy to simplify the migration. So this would be more of an accurate picture of, of what we, we run currently. And it also allows us uh, to have an universal view or a virtual view of all the storage available to the users in the web UI. Finally, um, the application support was really important for us as, as it's uh, one of the, the, the main aspects for our users to, to maintain the, the application parity. And uh, we, we basically divided in, in two uh, the, the kind of integrations we have. So on one side, we have the OSIS extensions for lightweight integrations, but also on the other side, we need the Riva acting as a bridge uh, between OSIS and the WAPI server, which is a, a software developed here at SAN as part of the CS3 uh, project uh, to connect to different uh, applications such as Office uh, Online, Microsoft Office Online, Collabora, or CodeMD. So last, uh, let's let's bring uh, bring up a few conclusion, conclusions. Sorry, um, we are 
really proud to be early adopters of OSIS and uh, the, the symbiotic relationships we built with OnCloud. So we're really, uh, we're really proud and really happy to see the fruits of all, all those things that started in 2018. Um, we also want to uh, stress or highlight uh, the fact that uh, we need to reduce the entropy in such ambitious update. So this is the way, uh, this is the, the main reason we didn't migrate both uh, from OnCloud 10 to OSIS and from bare metal to uh, Kubernetes. Um, we are currently in the middle or in the beginning of a uh, rollout plan in three phases that uh, that will be completed before 2022. And uh, we really want to drop uh, all our forks as uh, the, the project reaches uh, production readiness. Uh, also, the, the, the final side note is that we will, of course, reuse and contribute uh, to the broad uh, on-cloud community all the artifacts that we developed uh, for, for, this, for this enterprise. So um, let's, uh, let's meet on the Q&A uh, room for, uh, for all of your questions. And uh, I really wanted to thank you for, for having me and also to remind you to stay tuned for Ishing's presentation, which is happening in a few minutes. So thank you.